to start with determining what your structure is. Um, it's not a really good idea to have a sole proprietorship because you um, you don't have a veil of, of um, corporate you don't have a corporate veil, so if you're sued, you can lose everything that you have personally. So think about whether you want a partnership, an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, and some of that also will help you with your funding, and it helps you with tax breaks. In the last tax act, um, passive income was reduced by 20%, so your tax rate went down if you pick something, a structure like an LLC or a partnership, that sort of thing. And I, I like to encourage people to not try to hire an attorney for this and pay a lot of money because you can use LegalZoom, which is a lot cheaper. Um, there are other companies like LegalZoom that do that. Um, but basically, don't spend a lot of money just establishing your structure and your name. So they, then, yeah. I've, I've been telling people that partnerships are very, very difficult. It's more challenging than picking a partner for the rest of your life. And it's probably tougher. Yeah, Amanda knows I'm not a big fan of 50-50 partnerships. If you are going to have a, a partnership, you really need somebody who has control. Um, my personal experience with a 50-50 partnership was it didn't work out, and I haven't seen it work out very often. So it, ha it has to be a very unique group of two people. Yep. But, but somebody needs control. So after you figured out what your structure is, then what you want to do is create a business plan. and my advice is always you do not need a 30 40 50 page business plan but you need some basic elements in that business plan that include an executive summary that you actually write after you've completed your business plan um, and that should have a market analysis you should know how big your industry is and what is your niche within that industry why are you different who are your comp competitors um, you want to know what your marketing you want to put your marketing strategy in there. So, so now you know how you're different. How are you going to make sure everyone else knows you're different? And you have to have realistic financials, sources and uses of funds. Where's the money coming from? Where are you getting it? How are you going to use it? You have to be very realistic. Companies, startups do not make money out of the gate. If you show financial statements that show that you're making money out of the gate, nobody is going to believe you. And then you want to include your biography and any biographies of people that are advising you or that you have on the board. It's it really, you can do a very comprehensive business plan in probably five pages. You shouldn't really have to spend that much time. Then you want to create your infrastructure. And this means setting up your accounting system or outsourcing your accounting system, making sure you're getting some sort of general ledger set up. Um, you want to make sure you get all of your licenses, um, anything that's required, any permits, if you're doing building, um, all of that. You want to make sure you have contracts prepared, purchase orders prepared, you know, any document. Now, this is where you may have to hire an attorney to help you with contracts. But really, again, if you're a simple business, you probably can go on the internet and get a basic simple contract but if you if you got a complicated business or you've got potential liabilities you probably it's probably worth hiring an attorney just to at least look at something that you've drafted and then you want to list all of your financial resources um, and we'll talk a little bit more about where you're going to get your money but you for you want to start with what you personally have and what you're willing to put into this business and prepare a budget. Amanda and I do these workshops and the first the first part of the workshop is how much money do you personally need to live? Um, how much money are you going to have to pull out of that business? So it's very helpful before you even put your financials together for your business plan that you know how much money you need to make. So now we get to like where am I going to get the money? I got a great idea. I got my business plan. Where am I going to get my money? So a lot of businesses start with credit cards, believe it or not, and something like 60% um, uh, of small businesses use credit cards to launch their business. So it's not unheard of and it's not looked at poorly. And what you have to do is some research on what business credit cards 
give you 0% for a certain period of time, like um, 12 months or more, because hopefully you're making money at the end of that 12 months. So you really don't have to pay any interest for that period of time you're using those credit cards. You also want to make sure that you do put some of your own money in because if you then go to find other sources, people want to make sure you've got some skin in the game. Um, a lot of veterans ask me, should I use all the money that I got from my disability, like if they get a big chunk of change? And I'm like, no, you need to put some skin in the game, but you don't want to use all of your personal resources. You don't want to deplete that. And I see Michael laughing because he's <laughs> obviously, I'm not sure why, but he's obviously thought about that. So, <laughs> so yeah, you want to put some money in. You don't want to put all your own money in. I'm a big believer in other people's money, right? OPM. Um, whatever you do, though, on those business credit cards, make sure you don't miss any payments. So, again, if you can get a, tw a 12, 18-month, zero interest rate credit card, you want to do that. But once that starts kicking in, the interest rates are really high. So you want to make sure you uh, try to find an alternative financing source. In the meantime, don't miss any payments. So now you've depleted your credit cards. Who do you go to next? My recommendation is friends and family. Um, and it's not a simple, gee, call up my brother-in-law. Hey, will you give me five grand for my business? No. If you want friends and family and you want it to be a serious um, transaction, you really need to prepare a prospectus or an offering memorandum. And again, this might be a good use of attorney's money. Um, you, have to, you have to lay out all the risks. You have to um, create the structure. How much are they going to own? What are your units going to be priced at? Um, you have to be very, very clear up front that they have the potential to lose 100% of their investment. And you have to outline all of what the liabilities are. Um, and again, uh, and the, yes. Yeah, quick comment. When going to a family, be very, very careful of a family member that offers you something that sounds too good to be true. Yes. I've watched so many vets say, I got a brother-in-law that can get me 50 grand and he can do this and this and this and no strings attached. And almost 100% of the time, it's BS. Yeah. There was a gentleman who um, came to talk to the 100 entrepreneurs. I do remember he was the guy that started the zip line. He was a veteran. Yep. He yep. got all of his, remember him, Patty? He, mm -hmm. he was great. Yeah, he got him. all of his money up front from friends and family. And that's what he did. He prepared a very comprehensive offering memorandum. He sent it to everybody he knew and everybody they knew. And I think he raised something yeah. like $250,000 to launch. We had a, he had a party, like a launch party. Like he invited everyone and did a presentation. But yep. there were like letters of intent. And it was all in writing too. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was, he hired an attorney and had it done well. His, yeah. his name his name is Joe Durang. Joe Durang, right? And, uh, in case and there are videos of Joe Durang in case anybody wants. To. Yeah, it was a great it was a great presentation for anyone that wants to do friends and family. I would encourage you to look at his video online. Nice. It was really it was really good. So, um, so you've used credit cards. Maybe you don't have friends and family. I did have a veteran I talked to in Atlanta and I said, well, what about friends and families? Like, I don't have any that have any money. And I'm like, okay. So, so then we go to potential crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, um, which is very popular, you know, and there's two different kinds of crowdfunding. There's the reward based crowdfunding where you have to give something away. If you're making a t-shirt or a mug or whatever you're creating, if you're, if you're making a widget, you give them the widget. And then there's equity crowdfunding, which just came about when they passed the jobs act, I think in 2012, when did they pass that? I forget. Anyway, they didn't used to have that but now they do. But here's what you need to know about crowdfunding. Um, the average crowdfunding dollar amount is like the, a successful crowdfunding campaign raises on average $28,000. So it's not a whole lot of money. Now you always hear about the big ones and how many multiple thousands of dollars, but, but that's, 
you know, that's a small percentage because there's like $17 billion being raised just in North America on crowdfunding. So think about it. It's spread over millions of people trying to raise money. Um, and so, but if you want to do crowdfunding, the most successful way is through email shares. 53% of donations come through email shares, 12% through Facebook and 3% through Twitter. So you have to have a good network if you're going to crowdfund, whether it's through a reward base or an equity base. Um, the equity, and then each one has different kinds of fees. So you can look at some crowdfunding sites and they don't charge anything. A lot of nonprofit ones don't charge anything, but on average you're gonna have a processing fee and a and a per pledge fee of like 20 to 30 cents per pledge so some are all or nothing so like indiegogo you don't have to raise what you say but you know their fees are a little bit higher whereas kickstarter you have to, if you say you're going to raise 10 grand you have to raise 10 grand or you have to give all the money back but the, you know, there's always new ones coming up. So depending on what kind of business you're in, you want to try the crowdfunding source that meets that particular niche, because that's where investors and buyers want to go. Like if you're doing um, music videos, you want to go on a, a site like Patreon, where you basically are getting subscribers to pay a monthly fee to watch your video. If you're a nonprofit, you might want to go on something like Chuffed. So each one, there's different niches. The most popular are things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, but, but it really depends on what you want to do. And then the equity crowdfunding, that's where basically they are going to own a percentage of your company. So you don't have to give anything away except your ownership. So you don't, no t-shirt, just a percentage of your business. It just depends on what you'd rather give. Um, used to have to be um, a qualified investor to invest equity in a small business, but when the Jobs Act passed, they got rid of that rule. So basically anybody can invest in a small business through equity crowdfunding sources. And some of those sites are things like WeFunder, and local stake, Rocket Hub, Circle Up, um, and you can invest as, as little as $1,000. You can get people to invest in as little as $1,000 in those kinds of equity. And then you're owning a piece of the company. If it takes off, you're gonna get a good return. And if it doesn't, it's just like any other investment, you could lose everything. The thing about VCs, and I don't talk about them a lot with small business, um, VCs need a, a fast growth projection. So you don't usually see that with bread and butter businesses that a lot of the veterans I've talked to want to start like restaurants or things like that. But if you have an app or a tech or you're in life sciences or you're doing something like John, that's a good venture capital kind of business. But most bread and butter businesses that only grow five, six percent a year or less, that's not going to attract venture capital. So, um, so another source of lending, especially for small business startups is specialty lending. And that can be anything from merchant cash advances, um, small business loans, asset based loans, factoring, things like that. Um, you can find those on, on, um, sites like Foundation or Cabbage or on deck or Kalamato capital. Um, these are all, they're very expensive, but if you need cash up front for your small business, it's actually a very good way to go. Um, especially if you're taking credit cards, doing the merchant cash advances is actually not a bad way to go. Um, equipment leasing, if you're doing a, um, like a franchise e and they need equipment there's certain equipment lenders that partner with the franchise ors so they'll lease you that equipment um and and they feel okay doing that because you're a franchisee of somebody they have a partnership with so there's all kinds of sources like that you have to do a little bit of 
research to find out which one's the best for you. But that's a, it's really not a bad way um, for startups to get financing. Then there's SBA, the 7A and the 504s, and there is a veteran preference, um, but I've talked to veterans that have used them and they laugh when I say there's a veteran preference <laughs> SBA process because it's supposed to speed it up and it does eliminate a lot of the upfront fees, but there's no speedy SBA loan. Um, these recent PPP loans that were handled through the SBA were not SBA loans, by the way. It's just that they use the SBA platform to process the PPP loans. So the, the 7A loans basically are, you get them through the bank. You don't ever go directly to the SBA for an SBA loan. You go to your bank and some of the biggest lenders in SBA, SBA lenders are not your big banks. They're things like US Bank or Pinnacle or Live Oak. And you want to go to a bank that does a lot of SBA lending if you are going to go that route. But the bank will uh, lend you the money and then the SBA guarantees 90% of the loan. But when you go to the SBA, you're going to have to guarantee the loan. Your wife or spouse is going to have to guarantee the loan. You're going to have to pledge the equity in your home. I don't care if it's 10 grand. They're going to want to put what they call an indemnity deed of trust on your home. Um, and any other asset that you have, they're going to put a lien on. So it's, it's, it can be somewhat onerous, but if you can't get a traditional bank loan, the SBA is not a bad way to go. Um, but you, it is harder for a startup um, to get an SBA loan. They don't really tell you that, but it, it is a lot harder than if you have an established business, even if you've been running the business for six months it's easier to get an SBA loan than to go in and say, oh, I'm just starting. I haven't got any revenue or income. <laughs> it's a little bit harder. And you might be um, older than me when you get the money. Well, it takes at least 90 days. And that, I believe, is even with the veteran, speedy, whatever. Um, yeah, it's going to take, you have to plan. You, yeah, you don't need the money for at least 90 days if you're going to go the SBA route. I did have, um, I did talk to a veteran who did, it was the guy that owned the, started the gym in Virginia. Dylan, Dylan Bear. Yeah. He did two routes. He went traditional banking and SBA. And he, and so he didn't end up taking the SBA loan, I don't think, because he ended up qualifying for a traditional loan. Um, but that's not a bad way to go either. Just try to do both at the same time. Um, you it has to be a for-profit business, so you can't get an SBA loan if you're a nonprofit. And then there's the traditional bank loan. And this, you usually need at least two to three years of operating history, and you have to be making money to get a traditional bank loan, unless you're a per, you have a very strong guarantee. Like you have a lot of personal liquidity, or you're a lot of personal assets and your guarantee can help you qualify for a traditional bank loan, then you can do that. Otherwise, it's really hard for startups to get traditional bank loans. And then we talked about VCs. Um, again, it's really hard to do that if you're not in a, a biotech, life science, technology kind of company. They're just not interested in in that even though they will do early stage so that's um that's what i had there are sources to help you there's a group called score i've heard mixed things about but these are a lot of um uh, retired entrepreneurs that volunteer their time to help you and mentor you um i've heard mixed things about them i i think it really probably depends on what kind of mentor you get um, and then there's an angel network directory. And um, again, depends on the angel and if they're interested in the type of business that you're in. And then there's crowdfunding sites like Fundly that will lay out all of the crowdfunding sites that you might have. And then um, Amanda asked me to talk a little bit about like in this COVID time in addition to some of the businesses John talked about which would be great during COVID right a healthy building a healthy office 
Um, uh, obviously, the other kinds of cleaning services are great businesses right now. Everybody's getting their office cleaned at least weekly. Um, their gyms are getting cleaned probably daily. Um, delivery services, they're not going away. People are still getting their groceries through uh, delivery services, food. Drive-in movies, resurgence. So, um, niche grocery stores, still people are finding yeast in uh, niche grocery stores when they can't find it at Giant. Toilet paper. And toilet paper in niche grocery stores that you can't find. And thank God they considered liquor an essential business. But liquor and wine stores and beer and wine stores are booming. Um, also, if you have a very creative mind, puzzles and gaming is very hot right now. Um, and, and online sellers went up something like 76%. It's come down since then. But if you wanted to create a game and a board game and sell it through Amazon, you'd probably do pretty well right now. Legos are going crazy. And Legos. <laughs> Landscaping and yard services, they're pretty hot right now. Obviously, mask makers. And until they shut down again, breweries and wineries are doing very well because they're outdoor, for a lot of them, people are outdoors or they're in big buildings, people can socially distance. And then obviously there's the businesses you don't wanna be in right now, <laughs> which are <laughs> your restaurants, your bars, your nightclubs. Um, goes without saying, something like 16,000 restaurants have closed permanently. If you believe Yelp, 54% of all the restaurants will close permanently. So